You remember when you got her? You had hours and hours to just drive and dream. You spent your Saturdays fixing whatever needed fixing just to keep her running right. 20 years later, isn't it time you two got reacquainted? When you're ready, we're here. Because at LMC Truck, we know that while time may have passed, your passion for her never faded. Get her back on the road where she and you belong. In gears brought to you by LMC truck keep them on the road hey welcome to gears you know one of the most popular projects that we've done on the show is this old international cab over that we're turning into a wild tow truck called heavy metal now you haven't seen it for a while because we sent the cab off to the hot rod Institute where they put some paint on it but now that it's back we're in the process of reassembling the cab to get ready to go down on that chassis so Let's get back to it. Now, so far we have the seat and we have the dash in place, but as you can see, we don't have any gauges, we don't have any switches, we don't have any vents, we don't have anything. And since that's kind of important stuff, now is the time to lay it all out while you have complete access to everything. Okay, this is the layout of the original dash. And the first thing that you need to decide on any project is what are you gonna keep and what are you gonna reuse? For example, this driver's side panel is in really good shape and we like the location of the gauges because they're centered right over the steering column. So we're gonna keep that. We're also gonna keep the location of the light switch. What we're not gonna keep is this original 90 mile an hour speedometer and this original multi-gauge because those were marginally accurate from the factory. So we went to Classic Instruments and got a modern 140 mile an hour speedometer with a little tack right there in the center. So we got two gauges happening where there was only one before. And of course it's designed to slip right in the original mounting hole. Now for the second gauge, we like the idea of the multi-gauge, but obviously these aren't accurate. So we went back to Classic Instruments, had them put together a modern multi-gauge for us. This has temperature, volts, fuel, and oil, and once again, designed to fit right into the stock hole. Now, the original gauges used these mounting holes to mount the gauge from behind, so we got some holes to deal with. So, we got these indicator lights from Painless Performance. We're gonna put a green one here and a green one here for our turn signal indicators, left and right. Then we're gonna do a blue one here in the center for our high beam. Then these two down below, we'll put amber for our emergency flashers. And finally, since we're gonna use air assist on the brakes like the truck originally had, I'm gonna reuse the original air gauge until I find something I like better. Moving over to the passenger side, this panel is in excellent shape and we're definitely going to keep this U.S. Department of the Navy plaque that is part of the history of this truck, man, we got to have that. The center panel is where we got some issues. As you can tell, there are a lot of holes here that we are not going to reuse and we still have a lot of stuff that we need to put in this dash. So you got two choices here. You can either weld up these holes or you can just make a new panel out of aluminum and start over. A lot of times, this is the simplest, easiest way to go. Okay, that lays out the basic gauges and panels. Now here's what we have to add to this. Picked up some extra gauges from Classic Instruments, so we need a place for those. We're adding vintage air, so we need a place for the controller. Then we need to choose some vents and find a place for those. Now, you can get rectangular vents, you can get round vents, just kind of depends on how you want the panels to look. Now, we also got a new ignition switch and a headlight switch. We know where those are gonna go, but we don't know where the new 
wiper switch is going to go. So we've got to find a place for that. And this is just stuff we have. Now there's going to be some switches for the emergency lights on top of the truck. There's going to be a stereo system. There's going to be a lot of other things. And obviously you can't lay out a panel until you have everything. So we're going to leave this one blank for now, but we are going to choose some vents and put them in the outer panels. Now that's more like it. This is starting to look like a dash that we can use. Now another decision you need to make is what color your panels are going to be. Obviously these are painted, this is brushed metal, you can put upholstery on, you got a lot of choices here. But whatever you do it needs to match the headliner, the door panels, the seat upholstery, everything else. So it's best to get everything in place before you make that final decision. Okay, moving outside, the next thing that we're going to put on are mirrors. Because every big truck has got to have some big mirrors. You can't put little tiny hot rod mirrors on a truck like this that is a functional tow truck. Fortunately, the original brackets on the truck were in good shape. So we had the Hot Rod Institute paint those. Now all we have to do is put them on. The upper braces go on first, and new hardware is a must, as well as a new rubber gasket any place the braces contact the body. This will protect the body and prevent rust from starting between the pieces. The lower braces are next, and they are supported by an upper cross brace. Next comes the mirror bracket, and finally, the new mirrors finish off the assembly and give us something to repeatedly bang our heads on when we're working on the truck. Hey, welcome back to Gears, where we have been laying out the newly painted cab of heavy metal. Now with the dash in place and the mirrors on, this thing is actually starting to look like the cab of a tow truck. Now obviously there's still some pieces to go on, like the fenders and the step plates and that kind of thing, but it's best to wait and put these on once we get the cab back on the chassis. But as you can see, they have been completely restored and repainted, but not just on the top. Take a look at this. The underside has been completely coated in Raptor liner to give it a nice textured undercoat. This will not only protect it from rust and corrosion, but also from flying rocks and junk. So you can see that the Hot Rod Institute is committed to teaching all aspects of building and restoring a vehicle. That's why we like to support them. But it's a challenge to run a tech school these days with funding and accreditation and just the cost. So when we found out that the Hot Rod Institute didn't have a tool supplier, we decided to do something about that. All across America, in thousands of garages, carports, and backyards, there sits a project that has become hindered, stalled, or halted by the lack of time, money, or expertise by the owner. Sometimes the project is so lopsided that the owner just needs to sell it and start over. Other times, all it needs is a kickstart to get it moving in the right direction again. That's where we come in. Gears on the Road is brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. If you're running a technical school, keeping students coming through the doors is only part of the challenge. Having enough equipment and tools for the students to use is just as important. So we decided to spring a little surprise on Doug and Danny to help support the school and the students. Right now we're a very, very small school, so it's a great opportunity for somebody to get in there and have a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. We got classes, you know, three students in there, four students. There's a, the chassis class right now is running seven or eight. It seems like there's a lot of interest out there. Students wanting to get their hands dirty, working on something. It seems like everybody's got a project that they've been meaning to get to, or they've been, has a friend that wants a project they've been wanting to work on. I think we got a good opportunity where we're at now. Fortunately, I just happened to have some prototypes of the new Cornwell Platinum Series toolboxes. So, they not only got a chance to check them out, the question is, 
What color do you want? I decided to let him take one home with him. <laughs> I'm sure Cornwell won't mind a bit. <laughs>Tool Tech, brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. You know, everybody knows that if you're going to work on cars and trucks, you got to have tools. But sometimes those tools won't do you any good if you don't have access to different areas of the vehicle. And that's why most car people eventually realize they got to have some sort of lift. Fortunately, a lot has changed with lifts over the years. The most important issue being cost, because now they're actually affordable enough for the average guy to put a lift in his shop or garage. But it's not just about cost. It's also about choosing the right lift. So today we're going to walk you through some of the things to look for in a lift and hopefully help you choose the one that's going to work best for you. One of the most common and affordable lifts is the standard two post lift. You see these everywhere and as the name suggests, it has two posts that are bolted to the concrete. Then it has four arms that rotate out under the vehicle. This is a great lift because it gives you incredible access to the undercarriage, the exhaust, the drivetrain, and the suspension. Since these lifts support the frame of the vehicle, everything else is out in the open to be worked on. However, there are some things to be aware of on a two-post lift. First, you gotta buy quality. Good workmanship, materials, and welds are a must. Second, most two-post lifts need at least a four to six inch pad of concrete to support them properly. Finally, make sure you get one with the capacity you need. And height and weight are both things to consider here. For example, this is a 10,000 pound lift that stands 12 feet tall. It would be great for most applications if your roof is high enough. However, if you work on heavier, taller stuff, well, you're going to need to move up to a heavier, taller lift. And that's going to require not only a higher ceiling, but also possibly a thicker concrete pad, both of which can get really expensive. So make sure you check before you buy a lift that won't fit or that won't lift what you need to lift. But what if a two post lift won't work for you? What if you're working on something weird like this that won't fit on the lift because it's too wide or you don't have access to the frame rails? Well, that's where the mobile freestanding four post lift comes in. And it kind of combines a two and a four post lift to handle extremely heavy or awkward vehicles that won't fit on a conventional lift. Now it consists of four portable lifts that are loaded with rechargeable batteries, and they're simply rolled in place around the wheels of the vehicle. Then the lifts are connected together so they operate as one. So it's just a matter of pushing a button and up goes the vehicle. The cantilever design of the lifts give a stable base for lifting. Now these have incredible capacity. These are 18,000 pounds each and they're used to lift everything from semis to farm tractors to buses. However, they do come at a cost. One is the shop space they take up when they're not in use because even though these are portable, they do take up some space. The second is actual dollars, because 
These guys are not cheap, but sometimes they're the only thing that'll do the job. Well, hopefully, this gives you an idea what kind of lifts are out there and what you might need in your shop. Because I guarantee you this, once you have a lift, man, you'll never be without one. And now, it's time for another Quick Tip. Today's Quick Tip is one that you've already seen in action today if you happen to catch it. And it involves the need to drill or cut holes in a sheet metal panel. Now the problem comes in the fact that it's pretty much impossible to put a piece of sheet metal in a bench vise and tighten it down enough to hold the panel in place without distorting it or bending it. And even if you could, there's nothing supporting the center of the panel. So as soon as you come in here with your drill or your hole saw, you're going to bend the panel and fold it up like a taco. Fortunately, a simple solution comes by securing a piece of 2x4 in a clamp. Now make sure the wood sits above the clamp. This will not only act as a table to lay the piece on, but it also supports the center of the panel when you're cutting. The wood will also allow the drill bit or hole saw to sink into it, and it anchors the panel as it's being cut. So you end up with clean, straight cuts and no fighting the panel. Sometimes it's the simple things that make all the difference in the world. If you'd like to learn more tips to make your life easier in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. And now, Seal Tech, brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, helping restore the car of your dreams. For today's Seal Tech, we're going to deal with another important area to seal on a vehicle besides the glass, and that's the doors and trunk. Because leaky doors and trunks are not just a nuisance. Now, they can let water in, which can rust your floors, or they can let carbon monoxide in, which can kill your body. Yeah, it's pretty important stuff. Now, obviously, if you've got something more common like this, you can just get some replacement weather stripping and put it in. But the problem comes when you're working on something more odd like this, or you've built something custom and there is no weather stripping. Now, how are you going to seal the doors? That's what we're going to show you. If you have a piece of the original door seal, all you have to do is match it up with something in the steel catalog that's close. But if you don't have a piece of the old original seal, here's what you got to do. The first thing you need to determine is how the weather stripping mounts and how it seals against the door. Does the weather stripping mount to the body or does it mount to the door? For example, the original weather stripping on this old truck mounted here to this pinch weld and then you have this soft piece right here that crushes when you shut the door and it seals the door. So we need to determine what this gap is. Sometimes it's as simple as just shutting the door and measuring it. If that won't work, you'll need to take some putty. <laughs> All right, who bit the silly putty? <laughs> Classic silly putty works best and lay it in the gap and close the door. Then all we have to do is measure the putty to figure out how thick our rubber needs to be and match it up with something in the Universal Catalog. But here's what you have to watch out for. Notice that the pinch weld ends right here. So all the rest of this weather stripping down the side and across the bottom of the door will have to be a stick-on style, not a pinch weld style. Then, once you have the thickness of that figured out, find what you need in the Universal Catalog and you've got the problem solved. No more leaky, drafty doors. What are you working on? Brought to you by Woodward Fabrication, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Robert Villers from Warren, Ohio, and he said that he was 14 years old when his neighbor drove home 
in a British Racing Green Triumph TR4. He said he fell in love with it and he swore one day he was going to have one of those cars. He said so fast forward to 1985 and he purchased a rough 1966 TR4 for 500 bucks. Yeah, rough and British are two things you usually don't want in the same sentence. But he didn't care, man. He loved the car and he started working on it. Now he said his son helped him on the car over the years and the car was completely disassembled. Then the frame was blasted and powder coated. The body work was done and a fresh coat of British racing green was put on and the interior was redone. He said through this time, his son graduated high school, then he graduated college, then he joined the army, and then he got deployed to the Middle East. So he said his wife, Maggie, is now his new assistant on the car. And here's a picture of her working on the car. And he says that finally, after 33 years, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, I don't know if that means he's going to sell the car or if he's actually going to finish it, but hopefully he's going to finish it. From the looks of it, he's going to finish it and enjoy it, which is going to be awesome because the TR4 is a cool car. Got that little dome on the hood. They're really cool. So to recognize such a great project that's taken a long time, Robert, we're going to give you one of these bead rollers from Woodward Fab. It comes with the bead roller and all the dies so you can get down the road rolling some beads. Then we're going to give you one of these project planning books because this will keep you all up to date with everything that you have done to that project. We're also going to give you a Gears t-shirt and we're going to throw one in for Maggie and one for your son as well. Then we're going to give you a copy of the Purple Bicycle, which is a great children's story. And finally, we're going to give you a copy of Wheel Hub magazine so you can check out what's going on in the industry that you don't normally see. All right. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you want to get in on this, get your project featured on the show, go to the website, go to Gears Nation and submit it into what are you working on. The website's also the place to find out more information on any products you may have seen on the show, any Gears merchandise, and how to join Gears Nation so you can stream any of our episodes commercial free. Finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook so you can get some behind the scenes footage of our weekly web series, Shifting Gears. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Robert has a TR4 to work on. I've got a Jaguar back here waiting for some attention, which means it's time for you to get out there, find yourself a project, and start working on it. We'll see you next time.